The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hello everybody, thank you for tuning in this afternoon. We are about to begin with the Extend or End Late Life Strategy webinar debate. So if you could bear with us one minute or so as we get the final people signing up to this webinar just joining us. So just one more minute and we will kick things off. Thank you. So hello everybody and welcome to our Extend or End Late Life Strategy webinar debate. Thank you for joining us today. My name is Phil Chadney and I'll be acting as the chairman for this webinar. As you may know already, I'm responsible for the Extend North Sea Summit, the meeting point where North Sea's biggest late life decisions are to be made, taking place in Aberdeen on the 14th of September. This webinar here today is the first in a series of webinar debates and content pieces addressing the strategic question of extend or end late life production, plus the technical implications this has on the communities involved, covering asset managers, operations, production, development, decommissioning, and commercial executives. This first webinar will focus in on the supply chain perspectives to the extend or end debate, to look out for part two for the operator-focused debate as well. So, there are over 500 of you signed up today, so thanks so much for the great response, and thank you in advance to our panelists for their time. Just a brief bit of housekeeping before we begin. This webinar will last approximately 40 minutes and is being recorded, so we will send you the full audio recordings and presentations next week. We have two presentations, followed by a question and answer session. We will then hold live polls to get your viewpoint on the current late life challenges, which will then be commented on by our experts. During the webinar, you'll be able to post questions using the chat function of the webinar tool. We will try to get to the questions if we get time at the end. So the purpose of today's session is really to take a closer look at the big strategic question facing industry leaders in the current oil price environment. Should you continue or close production? Should you extend or end? Joining us today to address some of the key issues are Will Rowley, Vice President of Action FLS, and Stuart Gregg, Operations Manager for Asset Support, Late Life and Decommissioning at Amec Foster Wheeler. To find out more about how these late life discussions are manifesting themselves in the first meeting point to unite the entire late life community in the North Sea, with Centrica, Adax Petroleum, Apache, BG Group, Ineos Brea, BP and PSA all confirmed, head to decomworld.com slash extend. So without further ado, let's move to our first panelist, Will Rowley. Over to you. Great. Thank you, Phil. Uh, and good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I have a short presentation between myself and my colleague, Stuart. I'm going to focus on economics, and Stuart's going to focus on technical. So on to my first slide.
Okay, this is not meant to be an economics 101, um, and I appreciate that most of you can, can read what's on the slide. Uh, I just want to highlight the, the two conversations that go on around the economics on a field. Um, there's one which goes on around the asset, uh, field level decision making, uh, and I'll also come on to company wide decision making, uh, and some of the challenges that, that happen at both those levels. Where we are today, it's a challenging environment. Um, there are a lot of fields which are arguably in their fourth quartile, um, and a lot of decisions that go on with a lot of moving pieces. Um, most fields will have an economic threshold, and, uh, an internal limit in terms of what they feel is profitable, meets the various internal returns that the company needs for that particular asset. But the inputs into that are, are quite varied. There's your standard, obviously, uh, commodity pricing, there's a whole range of costs and a whole range of taxation issues in there as well. And these are moving beasts, particularly at the moment. So as we get into uh, the late life, we're trying to, we're looking at assets where we're trying to balance out these various pieces that move around. We're trying to look at the different decision making um, and how they impact it. And the reality is the closer you get to those limits, the more the external factors can disproportionately influence uh, the decision making. And when you look at that and you look further ahead, um, trying to make sense of those decisions when you've got trends that go a certain way, uh, sentiment that's a certain way, it's extremely difficult. And if you're in a tough market as we're in now, it's not just the costs you're trying to work out, you're balancing the risk. And when you move into the company situation, next slide please Phil, you're also trying to balance out how others perceive what's going on. Now we have a number of obviously private oil companies, private operators, we have a considerable number of public operators. Uh, a number of them have some significant cash flow implications and challenges. Uh, they also have external parties they have to keep happy in terms of uh, shareholders, in terms of their banking situation, um, and how they're perceived in the market, and, and how others perceive their production portfolio. Uh, these are quite important decisions that can impact the decision of whether to extend or to move to COP. Uh, it's not uncommon at the moment, and we have it with discussions with operators where they would like to go a certain way, and but because of outside constraints, because of cash, um, there's a lot of decisions which have been put off. So there's a, a to and fro and it goes on at the field level and then at the, at the company level. Uh, and it's not uncommon at the moment to have some quite different views between senior management and asset management on what's the best action to take. And often those views are because that you've got different priorities on the various people. Uh, the technical aspect which Stuart will touch on can often be driven at field level, asset level, or by people with a, uh, from an engineering and a technical perspective. Uh, and then you get the financial, which can be quite quite opposite, uh, particularly around the decisions of, of what money to spend and when. So I've just listed a few of the things that, that impact. Um, the list isn't exhaustive. And every time we get involved and we look at a field in the, in the fourth quartile, it's not quite a checklist, but it's, we spend quite a lot of time working with the clients trying to ascertain what is the key driver. Uh, the closer we can get to ascertaining which is the most important, then the better we can work with them and advise them on how to manage that late part of the life. But it's a moving beast, and even over a matter of uh, a few months, or certainly every quarter, we almost have to go back and reassess what the, those impacts are. So it's a, it's a live animal. Uh, it's a very challenging one. Uh, and when we talk later about timing, um, these are some of the things that you have to take into account. Um, even as a member of the supply chain, um, as a contractor and supplier, it's we have to think quite big and quite strategic because if we don't, we don't understand 
the drivers uh, and motivation of our clients. So from an economic point of view, just to, to sum up before I hand over to, to Stuart, you've got the two levels. They don't necessarily coincide, um, but you have to understand both of them to try and get some sort of clarity. And it will only be a narrowing down. It won't be a definitive answer in terms of where the a field is, what's the likely decision, and when it's likely to happen. Fantastic. Well, thank you for framing that opening um, portion of the debate, focusing on, on on the economic side of things to this to this extend or end question mark. So we're just about to move to our, our next presenter, uh, but before we do, um, I just want to bring to your attention the the chat box we've got um, on on your screens. If you do have any questions for the speakers, please type them in the box, and we'll try to get to them during the uh, Q and A session. So now, without further ado, we'll get uh, Stuart to uh, to share his thoughts on the extend or end question. Over to you, Stuart. That's great. Thank you, Phil. So uh, welcome, everybody. Many thanks for your time. My name is Stuart Gregg. I currently work for Amy Foster Wheeler in the Upstream Asset Solutions, Late Life and Decommissioning. I, I'm in quite a fortunate position. The previous 15 years of my career, I worked for two super majors, and I've been very lucky that Predominantly, most of my team time has been on aging infrastructure, both here in the North Sea and globally. So, the views I express is, is balanced across both sides of the community divide. Really, one of the biggest issues that I've come across and what I've seen people challenging with in the, in the late life domain is all around value. And and we've got the Oxford Dictionary statement on what value is. And I just picked out a few words here because these words are quite applicable to to how the debate goes and how senior managers and senior teams look at how they're extending their, their lives of their assets. It's about the worth. What's the worth to themselves? What's the worth to the customer? And what's the worth to the community? If you look at it from the mere perspective of Oil and Gas UK and, and OGA, what's the worth total of that asset and keeping it in production? And what it really boils down to is judgment. It really is judgment. And I'll talk about more about decision making and judgment in the next few slides. And it's about what is important that allows that judgment to be made correctly. So action to extend the tail. And I'm basing today's presentation on that all options for production enhancements, such as enhanced water injection, chemical, production chemicals, etc., all recovery options are being exhausted. So because of that, you, your reservoir is what it is. Its water cut is what it is, and it's only probably going to extend in the, in the negative environment. So the only option you've got is your OPEX or unit operating cost reduction. And, and how do you get there? And you can see there from the nice simple graph, if you've got the ability to extend by reducing your OPEX, you can move your COP to the right. And, and I'll explain how, how we've done that and how I've done that over the, the last few years as well. Just before we move into the decision-making process, what you can see there is late life, for, for, for me, swiftly and seamlessly blends into preparing for decommissioning as well. And I'll talk about that. So late, late life, extending the tail, it's a case of informed decision control and timing. What I've seen a lot over the, over the last 10, 15 years is groups of people making decisions on, on extending their life on parameters that they've got no control over, such as commodity price, regulation, legal, tax, and more importantly, one thing they've definitely not got control over is time. So how, how do you change that mindset? Well, what you've got to do is make your decisions on parameters that you are fully in control of, such as the resources you've got available or that you can bring in, the asset knowledge that you've got available to yourself, the engineering standards, and I'll talk about a bit of that more, contract and mechanisms, obviously OPEX, what you spend, where you spend it, how you spend it, and how you get the most value for that, and decision timeframes, which is a real critical aspect. So let's talk in control decisions. There needs to be a pragmatic approach to COP extension. I've been involved many times where COP seems to dance around from quarter to quarter, from year to year. It's a case of it needs to be a project team sits down, makes informed decisions, looking at all the different parameters, all the availability that they've got on the asset, what they can bring in knowledge-wise external, create a COP, not thinking about the commodity price, thinking about what they need to produce, OPEX and that unit operating cost, and getting that line in the sand. Because once you've got that line in the sand on your COP extension and you stick to that and you're driven to that, 
then that's where all the different aspects come together and that's where you get the team focus. So the approach must be a time-bound multiplier, as I call it. And what do I mean by a time-bound multiplier? No matter what you do, it has to be time-bound. I've been involved in the past where some modifications needed to be put in to extend COP. Those modifications weren't spec correctly, time dragged on, too much money was spent, and before you know, COP actually came to the left instead of going what was the ideal scenario was pushing it to the right. So everything needs to be time-bound. It needs to be run robustly with the correct expertise and the correct people. So that needs to dovetail in what we call the multiplier. So there is no silver bullet. There's no silver bullet out there in the industry. It's a case of looking at your asset and looking how you can multiply different aspects together. And I'll quickly talk through this now, and I'll go in some depth on some of the aspects. Engineering standards overhaul. We're all aware of gold-plated standards. I've just recently experienced myself with, with one, of our, one of our customers where they were looking to put in a, a new piece of kit. This piece of kit, both coupled with its maintenance program, would have lasted 30, 40 years. The asset COP is only seven years away. So again, you've got to have the rational conversation, and it's not about being unsafe. It's actually being pragmatic and looking at the engineering standards of what, what level we want to manufacture this piece of kit and how we want to maintain that over the next seven years. That gives us the value in returns of reliability, also potentially the value of resale as you go into decom, but also not the negative aspects that you're spending too much money in the first place, or we undersell it and you end up having to do more maintenance in, in the short term. We need to tie that with contract mechanisms as well. So what I see is the EMP model for contract mechanisms works quite well in the greenfield and brownfield. I still think it needs to be a lot more succinct, a lot more comprehensive. But what I've experienced on, on both sides, both as an operator and in the contractor community, is we apply the EMP business model to the late life and decommissioning area. A completely different pulls apart. The greenfield and brownfield is capex intensive. Late life and decom is complete opposite. It is it's do the job safely at the cheapest to maximize your, your revenues in late life and minimize your cost in decommissioning. But we, we apply, we, I seem to see this being applied a lot and do we need to challenge that? Another key aspect, what, what truly, what modifications do you need to, to get excess plant ullage? Do you need it? Can we get rid of it? Can we, can we remove it from the plant? And at the same time, can we do something to aid later decom? Really good example just from last year. Uh, somebody I was helping out, we, we managed to get some decommissioning scopes into, into last year's turnaround shutdown, where we placed some valves in, in, in the plant, which would enable easier for, to make the plant safe and to flush the, flush the flow lines at no extra cost other than paying for the valves. That means that when they come to decom in two years' time, they don't need to shut the plant down first before applying the valves. It's a real simple technical way of doing it. Also, plant ullage. I walk around a lot of plants here on the North Sea where they've got plant's still in place, it's still being maintained, it isn't, it isn't air gapped, it, is, it hasn't got a nitrogen blanket in there, so it's, it's being corroded away and that corrosion spreading to other parts of the plant that's being used. Really look at how we, do we need that plant ullage? Is a, is a, a short term in fill well or a near, a near prospect that's going to be brought back to the asset? Liaise with other operators to see if, that, if there's any opportunity. If it's not, then start to plan to, to remove that ullage, reduce your, reduce your OPEX. Safety critical rationalization, I'm sure many people have done that as well, but really what, what is safety critical as your plant pressure starts to drop, as your throughput of your plant starts to drop, what you've got safety critical today is that truly safety critical tomorrow in the late life. And again, it's all about rationalizing, reducing costs, reducing the need to have so much, so much workforce ultimately. Cold stacking equipment, which ties into plant knowledge. If we do cold stack equipment, Let's tie in with the DCOM team because what I've seen is that the asset focused team start to cold stack equipment. That equipment, as soon as you cold stack it and remove the heat that normally naturally comes through, corrosion rates start to increase. And then what you find is the DCOM team actually need that kit for either flushing or they need it to add extra structure to, to reinforce the asset so they can lift it up. And you find that a lot of money's got to be spent to either replace it or repair it where it could have been negated if there'd been cross-functional conversations taking place. Targeted valued maintenance. A lot of maintenance systems that, that I get involved in were set up correctly 10, 15 years ago. The plants changed, the parameters have changed. 
the life of the of the plants change? Do do the intervals still need to be the same? Can we can we extend the intervals? Can we look at what spare parts? Can we speak to our operators? Are they in the same position? There's some parts that we can get from them that we can have on a on a borrowing buy and borrowing system. Again, upskilling the workforce. As your pressures start to drop, as the as the plant becomes less reliable, if you do everything else in the multiplier and get the reliability where you need to be, can I start multi-skilling my technicians? Can I get more ownership into the workforce? And that again times delivery culture change. I'm sure everybody's aware here in the North Sea, although our efficiency figures are starting to go up, we're still behind other basins in the world. How do we get that efficiency where it needs to be? How can we get the teams to deliver? How can we get them to understand that by extending the life not only extends their employment and what is te technically their second home, but also gives them the pride, makes the place a lot more safer, tie that with technology deployment. One of my big drives everywhere I've worked is to get technology deployment into the oil and gas field. We are fantastic at doing it at the front end in the drilling domain, but at the back end in late life and decommissioning, we seem to be very slow at getting technology there. But again, what I've seen is, for a quick example, water injection system. So you've got wireless tele telemetry, similar to what's used in Formula One racing. You have that feeding back to your DCS, feeding back to onshore, telling you when that kit's going to fail. It's doing diagnostics on it, analytics. I think that's one of the systems we used, IBM, and there's other, there's other providers out there. It was doing a billion calculations a minute. It would tell us when that piece of kit was likely to fail. That meant our spares. We didn't have to have so many spares stored. Our maintenance system, we didn't have to maintain it as often because it would tell us when it was going to fail so we could get ready and get that planned and get that in the system delivered with the right delivery culture to keep the reliability up and keep costs down. And another one which, which I've seen elsewhere is, I guess, I guess like a, a virtual asset incentive equity schemes. So everybody who works on the asset or for the asset is in some sort of virtual equity scheme which is tied into you and operating cost, which means that as soon as you keep the if you keep the unit operating cost at a certain level, then everybody wins from from the, from the equity of the asset. Again, it's everybody working as one team of culture. There's no silver bullet. These aspects aren't exhaustive, but the key point is multiplying them and having them all time bound as as you move forward. So there's three key elements that empower the time bound multiplier. Again, as I mentioned earlier, it's a clear agreed COP strategy that's based upon but conscious of not in control decision levers. Time is expensive, particularly towards the back end of late life. In, cold, in control decisions have to align with the COP strategy, and as Will quite right mentioned in his presentation, that strategy is never set in stone. The COP deadline might be, but the strategy to get you there might not be set in stone. It needs to be reviewed, maybe not every quarter, maybe just once a year or twice a year. You just review it and make sure that whatever comes out of that review, it changes in the strategy come, they must be swift. And what is critical as well is what I've seen in a lot of businesses. If a decision's made and it turns out that you lost a year on COP or COP came in a year early, it's easy in hindsight to be critical of that decision. The true of that critique, if it happens, on the next asset that goes into that phase, it makes the decision makers a little bit more hesitant in actually making the decision. So it's key that everybody's aligned as a team and we don't look back from hindsight and say, we could have done this, we could have done that key to take those learnings to the next asset and apply them there in a positive manner. Critical aspect for me is during the tail of the asset, we must prepare the plant, the people, and the procedures for decom. I've seen some great examples both here in the North Sea and globally where we've extended the tail, did a great job, did lots of time bound multiplier activities, but then we hit the COP button, or the company did, and then you end up having to spend a lot of money getting the asset and the people ready for decom, which eroded all the value that was gained in the last two or three years of extending the tail. So it's key that thinking about decom, every turnaround as you're in the last late life phase, getting some aspects of the plant ready so that when you, the COP button is hit, the asset bumplessly transfers from a production unit into a decommissioning unit. And I guess what I'm, one of my key things that I try to get across both to my team and to my customers is, as Mark Twain puts it, action speaks louder than words, but nearly, not nearly as often. I see, and, and Will touched on his presentation, I see a lot of talking, a lot of debating, but while we're doing that and, and not really laying down a strategy and not laying down the elements to deliver that strategy, time is being wasted, which erodes the value as you go into late life. 
thank you. Thank you for listening. Thank you very much for that insight, Stuart. Fantastic to uh, have you sharing your experience for, for us today, especially coming from both the, uh, the operator and, uh, and contractor perspective there. So thank you very much for that, Stuart. So now what we're going to do is we're going to move to a Q&A session with both Will and Stuart, um, sharing some of their insight on some of the pertinent questions that uh, we found from our in-depth research with industry on this major theme of extend or end and this big conundrum facing particularly the North Sea at this, at this point in time. So the first question, um, which I'm going to pose to, to Will to, um, to, to give his perspective on first, is as follows. Is it time to challenge convention and government on end-of-life options going forward? Thank you, Phil. Uh, the straight answer is yes. Um, so UK OGA are out to a consultation at the moment, and they're talking some great words in terms of they seem prepared themselves to, to challenge the way things are done. And that's a good starting point. I just don't feel it's gone quite far enough. Uh, and two examples where I think it could go much further. It's we work. We're a global business, uh, the same as Stuart. We work around late life and decommissioning around the world. And there are a lot of very safe, proven ideas from other countries that, when we've tried to bring them into the UK, are discounted. Um, some of those cut across traditional boundaries uh, and make a big difference in reducing some of the costs. Um, but the UK way of doing things, um, and as Stuart mentioned, some of it's to do with gold plating, some of it's to do with just attitude. It means that the starting point builds too much cost into the system. So yes, I think we need to challenge. Uh, and the supply chain, I think the operators need to be more challenging. Uh, and to be fair, some of our clients as operators are being more challenging, uh, but it's still got things to do and a way to go. Uh, and just to finish off my short answer, just a slight example uh, from the salvage industry. Um, we have a whole set of guidelines and regulation around dealing with salvage, but what you don't have is government or a ship owner directing the methodology for wreck removal. What you have is a, is, uh, a request for a solution that dictates clean seabed, um, and then it's left to the specialist to work out the most effective way of dealing with it. That's not the situation we have in late life or decommissioning. It's far too prescriptive. Uh, we appreciate it's got to be safe, uh, and nowhere are we or anyone else suggesting you compromise that. But there can be further movement and change in attitude. So yes is the answer for me. Thanks very much for that, Will. So we'll go over to Stuart now with this question. And just to repeat the, uh, the question to those listening in, is it time to challenge convention and government on end-of-life options going forward? So what, what are your thoughts on this, Stuart? Yeah, it, the answer is yes. So I, I, I'm actually working with OGA in, in this area a little bit. So one of, the, one of the biggest issues, just to build on what Will was saying really, is quite rightly, and again, I'm, I'm, I'm in no place where I'm trying to undermine safety in, in any shape or form, we've got such a prescriptive process for transferring of assets from duty holder to duty holder especially in the late life decommissioning phase, especially around public liability in regards to decommissioning costs, that the waters are so muddy that when you sit around the table, it's quite difficult to decipher. And what happens then is frustration sets in. It puts off investors. It, put, it puts off hedge funds for actually stepping in that place. We hear, obviously, the UKCS, a lot of the, the super majors are starting to rationalize their portfolios. And we've got some brilliant examples in the past of Apache, for example, who, who took an, an asset who everybody thought was on its knees and has made it grow. And, and, and they've, got, they've got excellent production of it and excellent efficiency and really good safety record. That's an example of what we can do. And I think would happen a lot more in smaller pockets and smaller fields with smaller players if we had clarity from the government and from the regulatory bodies of what the path is to get there. At this moment, that path tends to be based on who you're speaking to, what their experience is, and it's not clear. There's no clear roadmap, and I know the OG is working hard in this place to get it. 
Fantastic. Thank you very much for your perspective on that, Stuart. So we'll go on to the uh, the second question now, uh, for both of um, uh, Will and Stuart. Um, starting with uh, with Stuart on this one. So, what does lean look like in late life production, Stuart? Does lean look like in late life production? So, it's a really good question. I, I've been quite fortunate because I've been visiting other industries to see how they do it. Predominantly, car making, automobiles and believe it or not, fashion industry, and also the aeronautical industry. And when you walk into these manufacturing houses, it, they, they smell of lean. The way they do everything, everybody buys into the KPIs that they're chasing. Everybody's aware of the structure. Everybody's aware of their place. I see it happening, and, I, and it's a lot better than what it was. When I stand on, a, on, a, on an off -sea, offshore platform, I don't always get that same buzz. And I think that, that purely comes down to people understanding what lean actually is. And it, it, the bottom line is it's about getting from A to B in the safest, shortest, cheapest, cheapest way. And that's how these other industries do it. I actually had a discussion with, with the UOG last week and also Oil and Gas UK. And there's, a, there's talk actually now of developing a lean academy within Aberdeen because a lot of our engineers, supervisors, managers, and seniors, senior people, and I include myself in this, only know what they know. So if they've been educated in lean, or they've experienced lean, or they've seen it, they, they kind of grasp what it is. But if you haven't got that, I think you need that You need that level of training. So I, I'm a big advocate with, in my team of getting people experienced, getting lean coaches in, so they understand what, what lean means. So they start to live and breathe it every day, and then bring it into their work life. And, and some, of, some of my colleagues have even taken it into their personal life about how they manage their, their personal lives as well. So I guess, what does it look like? It's got many different facets but it's about doing things efficiently. But unless you see how it's done efficiently, I don't think it's something that can be self-taught. It has to be expressed and has to be taught by professionals. Fantastic. Well, thanks for your perspective on that, uh, Stuart. And obviously very excited to hear of uh, discussions of this uh, this Lean Academy, as you, as you referenced there. So uh, watch this space, I suppose, for that. And and what's your perspective on this, Will? What does... What does does lean look like in, in late life production for yourself? Well, it, as with Stuart, I getting clarity over the objectives and, and getting alignment around what people are actually trying to do is is often the hardest bit because once you've got those objectives, then it's easier to use them as a reference point to come back to. And Stuart mentioned earlier in his presentation about um, people replacing equipment um, with brand new equipment. 10-year life, 15-year life, uh, when the field's only got five years left planning. Um, those sort of examples go on all the time. Uh, even with certain operators, we have lean practices from other parts of the world which are perfectly safe and effective. And you challenge to bring those practices into the UK, um, all technically within the guidelines, but the inherent processes that are built up over many years mean that you're, it's pushing water uphill. Uh, and this is within the same client. Uh, it's just a different division, a different part of it, because the attitude's wrong. Um, the starting point is a different set of uh, regional or local guidelines. Uh, and that's what you're fighting. Um, there's, there's a lot of cost that can be taken out, and we can be much leaner in all our operations. For us in the supply chain, I think half the challenge is we're starting from the wrong point. When we're asked to do things that don't compromise safety, um, but just aren't efficient. So just to, to sum that, uh, we need to get clarity over the objectives, get everyone aligned. Thank you, Will. And, and one thing that has certainly come up in the research that um, we at Decom World have been doing with the whole uh, offshore community in the North Sea is, is on this lean topic, you know. One of the biggest challenges seems to be getting this balance um, between lean, running things as lean as possible without compromising asset integrity, safety, and, and personal safety as well. So there's, there's the question of how lean do you go? So I suppose I'd like to pose that back to you, Will, and, and get your thoughts on that. How do, you, how do you run things as lean as possible without compromising asset integrity, safety, and, and personal safety. OK, well, I'd like to split those three parts out, because us, and I'm sure Stuart's the same, and with most of the people listening, 
safety of asset safety and personal safety are never compromised. That's just never, uh, never up for question. Um, so I'll focus mainly on integrity. But just before I go that, um, there are different attitudes to um, to what is what is safe. Um, and I'll pick up on a point Stuart made. Um, approaches and activities that can be perfectly safe today may look different to what was done five, ten years ago because the asset has changed, activities have changed. Um, and it's very easy and it happens far too often that we may challenge how something is done. We're not compromising the safety and the output. We're just challenging whether it's the, the procedure and the guidelines that were built, built and put in place five, ten, fifteen years ago were efficient. Um, so we never compromise safety, but it doesn't mean we, we don't challenge the understanding behind it. But integrity is a, is a big aspect. Um, there are degrees of flexibility, and it's not uncommon for us uh, to find we've got more knowledge and experience and more confidence over things like fatigue life and can be robust about assuming something will last another three, five, seven years. Um, but internal guidelines will force someone to say, no, this has to be replaced because we have to maintain a minimum of 10 years or 20 years design life. Um, so again, it loops back around to, to attitude, but you can go surprisingly lean if you've got that right attitude. Uh, so it's about getting that framework, and as we said earlier, getting everyone aligned. So let's not create a self-defeating situation where the guidelines are forcing up costs uh, and preventing uh, an asset becoming lean, which then extends the life. Absolutely. Well, thank you very much for your uh, perspective on that. Now, now over to Stuart on this on this question as well. What are your thoughts? Do, are you aligned with Will on this in terms of how lean do you go? Yes, I, I'm pretty much aligned with Will, to be honest. Uh, one, one thing I would say in regards to, to the safety, and there, there is definitely, again, I, I'm doing this right now, and I've done it with another customer late last year, is when you look at the competency profiles of the, of the guys who are actually delivering the scopes at the, at the coal face, their competency profiles are huge. And when you actually break it down and speak to the men and speak to the supervisors and managers about what these, these folk are doing, they never really employ any of these competencies. And also, some of these competency courses are one-offs. So they do it once. They might sit in a classroom for three or four days, do a, a multi-choice exam, and then never, ever do it again. So you've got to ask yourself, what value is that giving? Is there another way that I can get that message that's meant to be applied by that four-day course, the real key elements, in a more cost-effective, more powerful manner. And what we've done with, with one of our clients is we're using experts within that company to, who are going offshore and doing lunch and learns over three or four days with, with the whole crew. And the guys, it's an interactive session. And because they're doing it with their peers and with their friends, they're, they're getting a lot more out of it and they're learning a lot more they're rather sitting in a classroom where we send them to some city that, that may be next to where they live with a bunch of folk that they don't know. And the cost benefit is to the, to the customer. And also they gain because the knowledge levels are, are we're proving the knowledge levels are actually higher. So it may sound counterintuitive that we're slimming down their competency profiles and we're not giving them as many courses as what they used to have. But actually, we're slimming them down. We're making them fit for what they actually deliver offshore. Whilst other aspects that they do need that's over and above their competency profile, we're doing that in a more personal manner that gets the retention rates from a knowledge perspective higher. In regards to asset integrity, it's, a, it's, it's about looking at the parameters. So I've seen horrendous examples of where we've, where I've seen vast swathes of tonnage of secondary steel being, being replaced, when in reality that secondary steel didn't need to be replaced, but that's what the standard said to, to basically to, to support Will what he's saying. So it's again, I go back to what I said earlier, and, and everybody's in this bracket. You only know what you know. If you've been in this game for 15, 20, 25 years, and you've worked on Greenfield, and you've seen the asset go through all its full life cycle, and you're in late life, unless you understand what's required in late life, you always revert back to your experience and your learnings. And that experience and learnings has always been in full, in full production mode, 
hundreds of thousands of barrels a day, high pressures, kits in good condition, maintenance system tells you what I need to do. It's a completely different arena in late life and it's about looking at what do I need and what do I really do not need to produce this asset safely and it's getting the right people in the room to make those decisions. Absolutely. Thank you very much for your thoughts on that, Stuart. So we'll move on to talking a little bit about um, late life timelines now. So one of the questions that seems to come up time and time again um, that I'd like to get your perspectives on is how do we increase the confidence we have in late life timelines? So uh, Stuart, what are, your, what are your thoughts on this firstly? Well, it's difficult and it's a case of having strong people making, making informed decisions and those decisions are right from reservoir engineer all the way through to the, to the pipeline operator or the, or the pipeline engineer and everybody in between to understand what you've actually got on your hands, how strong is that data. Once you've got that data and you've got confidence in that data, you need to be crunching it to understand what you need and what you don't need. And I can I give, you, I give you a tangible example. So one of our customers, we thought we needed a methanol skid because we thought the water cut was getting a bit higher in, in a gas field. So it was likely we were going to have a lot of hydrates. Operator spent a lot of money on this. We didn't check the data again, which, which we should have done maybe. And then that methanol skid was never ever used. But again, that was a lot of money that was spent on an asset in a late life phase that isn't required. And that's an example. But I'll give you another example of where a flare stack we thought it needed to have extra tensioning and strengthening put to it. When the first lot of calculations stated that, we challenged the calculations and we did it again and we didn't, if anything, we didn't have to do anything at all for the last three years of production. And you've got to get that balance right. And again, it's, a, it's about experience and teaching people. It, it, it's a difficult situation because you're only learning what engineers have learned over the last 20 years where everything's been belts and braces because it is a dangerous environment and that and it still is a dangerous environment but those parameters have shifted and the engineering mindset needs to shift to match them as well so that it needs to match the risk. Thanks for that Stuart. So Will, what are your thoughts on this? How do we how do we increase the confidence we have in late life timelines? I think the reality is at the moment we're going to struggle. Um, with the current guidelines and the current macro environment we're in, it's uh, it's very hard for the for the operators um, to have confidence in their own timelines for their own fields. So for us in the supply chain, it's, it's even harder. Now, the only thing we can continue to do, and it has improved, but it's still got more to do, is improve the communication and degrees of transparency. We've seen quite a marked improvement over the last two, three years with operators being uh, more forthcoming with not just their plans but what drives their plans. Um, that could go further and it could be more widely adopted uh, and that would help. That would help. So it's, it, it's a tough one but there's, I think there's a great deal other than improve the communication and the transparency that we can do in the short term. Okay, well. So we've got a couple more questions before we're going to go on to uh, the final stretch of this uh, this live webinar, where we're going to get your perspective as listeners on some of the key questions. So uh, stay tuned for that. So we'll just go into two, two of the last questions here now um, for our speakers here. So this one is um, is for Will to 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 uh, answer first of all, and this is in regards to to stakeholders. So. In terms of this whole late life space and the, the, the decision whether to extend or end, are all the stakeholders aligned? What are the conflicts of interest in late life decision making, and how can the conflicts be resolved? Uh, well, I talked earlier about there's conflicts within a company in terms of uh, asset level and uh, corporate level. That becomes more complex when we add in the partners in a field. It's at the moment, the differential between partners and their objectives and their alignment is can be huge. Um, there are some examples where it's, it's improving, but I'd argue that the majority at the moment we're getting greater conflict, particularly with a lot of the small partners. 
um, who have greater economic constraints, whether it be cash constraints uh, and different objectives. Uh, so at the moment, there's, there's less alignment uh, for the majority uh, than there has been. Um, what we need, certainly within the UK, is we need some of the nice words which OGA have indicated about how they will manage the various stakeholders uh, going forward to be reflected in reality. Um, and as Stuart said, this, it needs to be a bit more than words, it needs to be some action. We've been in a little bit of a, uh, a grey area because of the changeover um, and there's still a bit of uh, lack of clarity between DEC and OGA. But as that gets clearer, if it really is some peace, then we should have at least have a mechanism to solve some of the conflicts because they are quite buried at the moment. Absolutely. Thank, thanks for work. thanks for that, Will. Stuart, what are your thoughts on this um, this, this whole stakeholder perspective? You know, taking into account the uh, the potential conflicts of interest and so forth. What are your thoughts? I think there's pockets of alignment, but I support Will's view. So I've seen misalignment within within organisations and then within an organisation to external domains such as regulatory bodies or even fishing industry. And again, I think a lot of it's down to what is the structure? What is the what is the straight line path that everybody's following? What regulations feed into that? Where do OGA and DEC rest within that path as well? I just think another level of transparency needs to come in there, and it's a case of getting together, looking what that path towards late life and decommission actually is, and there will be outliers, but actually sticking to that. It was really interesting. I was at a conference yesterday. And, and that really stood out for me because there doesn't seem to be clear alignment on, on the way forward. It's, it's almost in it's classic of our industry. It's a case of who wants to test it first to, whether, to see whether it, it's proven or not. So are we all aligned? No, we're not. Is there efforts to try and get us aligned? Yes, I definitely see that in pockets, but it still needs some real strong leadership to get us where we need to be. Absolutely, Stuart. So we'll go on to our last uh, last question now for you both. Now, this is um, in regards to the contracting process. So do we learn and do we challenge the commercial contracting process? So over to you, Stuart, on this one. I actually touched on this in my presentation. Yes, we need a challenge. As, as I mentioned in my presentation, where I still see us applying an EMP, Greenfield, Brownfield contracting model in late life and decommissioning. And a real simple example that I, that I actually witnessed over three or four days, I was at a, a well-known car manufacturer in the UK at their plants with their senior managers, and they were looking to give a contract to a, about a braking assembly. They wanted a new braking assembly for their new model. And the way they approached it really quickly was they knew who was capable of designing and manufacturing that braking model. They invited them in for a morning session each over four days, so it was four companies they invited in. They allowed them to present how they would design it, how they would build it, how they would assure it, and how they would help, help them maintain it over the course of, of the car's life cycle. From that, once they'd done that piece, they then sent out the commercials to these guys, and then within weeks they signed on the dotted line. That is a real good example of how you get robust contracting management and robust delivery from an approved supplier. What I see within our late life decommissioning is we still apply the old ITT process. It goes on for months and months. A lot of companies are competing. A lot of companies are spending money, ex expending hours to, to get it to the standard that's required and then once selected. And unfortunately, all that costs time. Time costs money. And all that money somehow has got to be regenerated within our business, within, within, within the business of oil and gas late life and decommissioning. And, and that just decreases the efficiency. So. I think there is ways we need to challenge it. We need to look at other industries to become more efficient, but also assure that the customers get the service that they require. Other industries do it really well. I think we need to learn from them. Fantastic, Stuart. I appreciate that uh, cross-industry example there. I think it'd be very, very relevant to us here. Now, um, Will, what are your thoughts on the commercial contracting process? Do we need to uh, challenge challenge this at all? We do, and I'm sure Stuart is like me and a number of others. We are, um, and 
the advantage of having a bit more grey hair is I've seen some of the issues and problems we had in 2003, 2004, 98, 99, where Significant parts of the supply chain either went bust or were very close to going bust um, because of the liabilities and poor contracting practice. Um, so some of the things which we're being asked to consider, uh, we're, we're pushing back and, and trying to be proactive, but some of the mistakes from the past are being ignored uh, and I think will happen again. Um, on the decommissioning part in particular, it's there's a lot of risk around poor information which we try to, to mitigate but we're still being asked to take excessive um, liabilities uh, around the contracting when a lot of stuff is out of our control and it becomes significantly disproportionate to the activity you do. And what we'd rather try to do is to, is to look at mechanisms where we can share the upside. So if we can get things done quicker, uh, if we can get better aligned so that there's a value in trying to get things done cheaper and easier and we share that value. It's very easy for service operators to impose the downside but they seem highly resistant to building an upside into contracting. Um, and, and that's a challenge. Uh, I mean we're a reasonable sized business but we we struggle. We struggle. Um, and there's, I mean, we all know I think in the supply chain there are businesses out there which are taking risks which are very high uh, and if they get it right they'll survive if they get it wrong they'll go bust and it's as blunt as that thank you very much will so we're going to move on to our live polling session now so this is a a, a, um, a chance for you as listeners to vote on your perspective um, of some of these late life conundrums facing our industry so we'll load up the uh, the first poll, and um, this is looking at the risk factors and getting you to vote on what you think is the highest risk factor impacting the North Sea Basin. So you should see that up on your screen now. So here's the question, just to repeat it. What is the highest risk factor impacting the North Sea Basin? So please select uh, one of the options. You've got premature decommissioning the decommissioning domino effect, integrity failure, or lack of investment in a new EMP projects. So we're just seeing the votes come in and we'll give you a few more seconds to vote. So we'll give you uh, uh, about five more seconds to, uh, to vote. So if you just like to make your decision and choice now, okay, three, two, one, and we'll close that off. So we'll pull up the results on the screen now for you to see. Um, so we've got the uh, the results in front of us from the uh, the many of you that have voted. So thank you very much for that. Um, and I'd like to get uh, Stuart's viewpoint on this. Stuart, is that um, matching what you would have expected to see? More or less, I would see lack of investment in new EMP projects. Naturally, when things are in their late life and going into decommissioning, it, it's nice to have something that's replacing that to keep to keep the, the UKCS going for much, for much longer. And I do think the UKCS, ultimately, if we get this right, efficiency across the life cycle has got a strong future, particularly west of Shetland as well. I would have expected to have seen decommissioning domino effect a bit higher. I'm starting to see that now. I'm starting to see operators who are just saying, Enough's enough on this asset. We can't, we can't actually get the revenues that we require. But that asset may have throughput from another asset. I know we've got examples. It's Fairfield and UKCS that's fed, that has a few of our assets that feed into it, and they're going to decommissioning. So now the other operators are looking at how they can get their product to market as well. So I think that the decommissioning domino effect is, is really high on the OGA's agenda because they, they can see that, that really getting a grip. Absolutely, Stuart. Yeah, so this decommissioning domino effect has certainly come up in our research time and time again as being a, a big issue as well. But um, of course, naturally, there's that longer term uh, view as well of the uh, lack of investment in UMP projects. So I can see that um, the reason behind that being um, the highest voted uh, risk, as it were, in that first question. So um, thank you for voting on that one. And now what we're going to do 
is pull up the, the second question. So you should be able to see that on your screen now. What is the biggest late life challenge? Establishing a robust late life operating model, applying a lean approach without compromising safety, getting clarity on timelines for close of production, defining post close of production maintenance. So I'll give you a few a uh, few seconds to vote as per last time. So uh, leave you to vote now. Okay, so we're seeing the uh, the votes come in for this. So we'll give you uh, another few seconds. So once again, what is the biggest late life challenge? So five, four, three, two, one, and we'll close that. Now we'll uh, pull up the results on the screen. So quite an uh, evident um, set of results we've got there. And uh, Will, I'll pass over to you to uh, comment on those, if I may. It's well, yes, I mean, it's very clear um, that late life operating models, um, as I mentioned from the economic point of view, and Stuart mentioned, there are lots of variables. And because the environment we're in today is outside of a lot of the experience that's uh, currently uh, within our clients and, and the wider market, uh, people are scrapping around trying to find uh, that model that, that works, that gives them the flexibility. Uh, and gives them the opportunity. Uh, now, we're, as we said before, they are obviously constraints within that, um, but we've got to get this sorted sooner rather than later. Um, and you can't just wait for, for OGA and others to, to come up with the ideas. It's got to be a much more inclusive process. Absolutely, Will. Thank you for your comments there, and thank you for voting on that second question. Now the um, penultimate question in this live polling session, how cost effective can we be in the late life phase? So you can vote there on the, uh, on the percentage points, 0 to 10, 10 to 20, 20 to 30, 30 to 50. So if you'd like to vote now, once again, we'll give you a few seconds to vote. Okay, so we're seeing the votes come in. Thank you for voting. So we'll wrap this up in three, two, one. So we'll pull up the uh, results there. So the results should be shown on the screen now. And uh, Stuart, I'd like to get your perspective on um, on the outcome of this question here, please. Yep, I would agree with that 20 to 30 percent. In my experience of where we've delivered this, it, it tends to be around in that area. There's, there's obviously some aspects where we, we have actually delivered it a lot higher. It all comes down to boldness, really. It all comes down to how bold you actually want to be. I've got examples of, of, of clients that have reduced the, the full-time employees offshore, dramatically deployed technology so they can manage the asset. I've got other clients that have basically they've had three trains offshore and they've shut two down. They've shut one come down permanently and one they just bring on when, when it's required from a peak perspective. It's about boldness and it's about the opportunity, this huge opportunity. And if I look at, again, the time-bound multiplier and you apply that, when you, when you do apply that and you chip little bits off here and here and there across different aspects, across different functions, and everybody's working as a team, I tend to see it land within the 20 to 30 percent mark. Fantastic. Thank you, Stuart. So we're on to our final question now before we wrap up. So, should there be a suite of regulatory concessions in the late life phase, and which areas would benefit? So, if you could pick the area you think would benefit most, is it topside fabric maintenance? Is it maintenance of rotating equipment? Or is it perhaps corrosion management strategy for pipelines? So, I'll let you vote, and once again, give you a few seconds.
Okay, so I'll give you three, two, one, and we will collect the results. So the results should now be on our screen. Pretty close call there. But um, yeah, I'd like to get uh, Stuart's perspective on this, please. Yeah, again, top side fabric maintenance, it, it can be a contentious issue. So I strongly believe that we could be smarter about the way we do FM towards the back end of, of the life cycle. But it, again, it's a balancing criteria against the engineering standards. I've seen customers that still apply the rigorous standard that they, that they would as if it was two years old, which means it's a full back to bare metal primer, four or five coats applied, lots of expense, lots of scaffolding, excuse me. And I've seen another customer who's very pragmatic, who working with a working with a, a fabric maintenance contractor developed a paint so that they did very bare prep work and they sprayed it on and then for the last three years they did another coat again. And then when it came to decommissioning they didn't have to do any FM and they saved a heck of a lot of money. So I think there should be some level of regulatory concession within the fabric maintenance. Got to look after primary steel, but when you're looking at secondary and tertiary steel in the last three, four, five years of a life, how many layers of paint do you actually need on that? Could the standard be dropped just to ensure that it, it's nice and safe, nice and robust, so when we go through the decommissioning. But currently now, a lot of, a lot of our customers have to comply with their safety case, have to comply with regulatory expectations, so they've got to go and do the full engineering standard, even though the asset won't be there in three or four years' time at a lot of expense, which again, as I said earlier, you're spending that money in late life, you're actually bringing the COP to the left, not to the right. It's, again, it's about having a pragmatic conversation around the standards and how bold you actually want to be. Brilliant. Thank you very much, Stuart. And Really, that's all we've got time for today. We're, we're running out of time, and we've actually gone beyond uh, the time time that we sort of said we'd uh, we'd do. But there's been so much to discuss and so much interesting topic to debate as part of this extend or end conundrum that uh, I wanted to make sure we covered everything. There's a lot of questions and people requesting information about the topic discussed, which we'll look to address in the second webinar of this series. So look out for that. Don't forget to come to the Extend or Sea Summit too to hear more. Um, about this late life strategy conundrum facing the North Sea. And that's on the 14th of September in Aberdeen. So with over 250 of the biggest names expected, plus 30 exhibitors, and unique insight from Alex Petroleum, Apache, BP, Centrica, Ineos, PSA Norway, and many more, this is the only meeting point to bring together the entire late life community. So you can learn more simply by going to decomworld.com slash extend. So I'd like to say a huge thank you to Will and Stuart for giving up their time and sharing their expertise today. It's been a fantastic discussion, and I couldn't have done it, done it without them. So thank you very much to, uh, to Will and Stuart. Um, I will give access to the full audio replay and presentations um, in my email next week that I will send to you all. Um, so please feel free to share that with your colleagues, clients, and the entire community. We want to spread the knowledge as much as possible to support the North Sea. Thank you for tuning in, and goodbye.